what type of Etsy business you're interested in. That'll help us tailor the slides as we go through today's session. Some etiquette just to kick us off. Um, if everybody could just stay muted and use the chat to ask questions. So I'm glad a lot of you are already active there. That's what we'll be referencing throughout the workshop today to answer any questions live. So feel free to utilize chat. And this is being recorded for YouTube. So just a heads up for everybody, we'll be sharing this after the fact if you wanna reference back to it. Um, I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Megan Sweary. I will be moderating the conversation with Kristen today. I work at the Papa John Center for Entrepreneurship here at Iowa State. And essentially we help entrepreneurs with different programming events similar to today's session. Um, and a little information about today's workshop. It is a part of a larger workshop series called the Start Something Series. And we are talking about all things side hustles. So as you hopefully know, today we're talking about how to sell on Etsy and get noticed. And we were really inspired by this idea of side hustles and people who have a passion and turning that into a business. And so there are three more sessions after today's. They're all happening on Wednesdays over the lunch hour. And so if you're interested, head over to our website and where you already were to register for this session, you can see the others as well. Uh, with that, I'm gonna jump right in and have Kristen introduce herself and tell us a little bit more about you. Thanks for having me here today. It truly is a pleasure and an honor. Um, we were chatting about it a little earlier and I realized I've been selling on Etsy now for almost 15 years, which really that blew my own mind because it felt so new. And like, I still think of Etsy as a newer marketplace and I'm like, it's actually not <laughs> at all. Um, so just kind of a broad sweep of who I am, the, the highlights of my career and, and why I'm here with you today. Um, I'm Kristen M. Roach. I'm an artist, author, entrepreneur, Locally here in Ames, I'm most well known for owning and operating Little Woods Herbal on Main Street. Uh, I'm a formally trained artist, which less of you probably know about me. And um, I specialized in oil painting and art history. My artworks and illustrations are collected internationally, including, and I still kind of can't believe this, a museum of contemporary craft in Sweden. And my book, Mend It Better, which is published by Story Publishing, has been distributed worldwide. In 2020, I received the Iowa Arts Council Artist Project Grant to create exhibits downtown um, to help support local artists who are economically impacted by the pandemic. And that same year, Little Woods was selected to represent small businesses in Iowa for the This Is Iowa program. Um, and I think that's it. That's me in a nutshell, condensed. But I've been selling online for over 15 years now. It started out with craft which will, I still do. And now for Little Woods and um, for uh, my art business. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. So, so we... yeah, about Little Woods more specifically, because I feel like locally, especially, that's what you guys all know me for. So over a decade, Jason, my husband and I have joked about our retirement plan. This is like kind of started when we were in college. He had brought me back a suitcase of tea from China and I was working at a coffee shop at the time and he was going to Iowa State. And we kept saying like, oh, wouldn't it be fun? You know, once you're done with your engineer stuff and I'm done with my art stuff, we'll retire to a little town in a rural community or like, you know, just like a small town, college town vibe because we liked it here and uh, open up a tea shop on a main street. Like, you know, kind of like the one in, downtown Ames. Wouldn't that be fun? And so now the running joke is, is that I retired and that this is my retirement. Uh, he's still, you know, working his full-time gig. But so we started uh, real simply selling on eBay of all things, um, just a way to like kind of make a side hustle, right? We were, about, I was about to give birth to our daughter and we just needed to clear some things out of our house. And I kind of fell into this category of reselling bulk herbs online, which is totally crazy. And then a couple of years, we, it did so well that we decided to start an actual e-commerce web, standalone website off of eBay. Then we started selling my own blends at the local farmer's market. And that was a real game changer for us because at that point it had pretty much exclusively been bulk products that we were reselling online. And I had listed my blends, but no one was really buying them in all honesty. My friends and family 
were so supportive and they kept being like, your teas are so good. People just need to taste them. We need to figure out a way to get people to taste these teas and then they'll buy them because it's a real barrier to sell food products online when people haven't had a chance to smell, to taste and experience them. And so they kind of twisted my arm into selling at the Ames Farmer's Market. My good friend, Sharon Stewart, loaned me a farmer's market or her tent so I, could, I wouldn't have to buy a tent because money was really tight. And my other good friend, Andrea Amato, who became our first employee, she offered to come and stand in the booth with me and kind of hold my hand with dealing with the public. <laughs> so this is back in, uh, you know, 2015. Every weekend we got asked, well, where's your guys' tea shop? I like, I like what you're doing. Where, I want more. And so by the end of the season, we had decided to start looking for a physical space outside of our home um, to run the business from so I could hire an employee and that kind of thing to help me fill orders. And it was literally Christmas Eve when they told me, uh, when the realtor called me up and said, I found your spot. And I'm like, it's Christmas Eve. Do you really want to show it to me now? And she's like, yeah, this is your tea shop. And I'm like, I don't want a tea shop. I just want like a place to fill orders and a commercial kitchen. And, and she's like, no, no, this is your tea shop. I know you said it was your five-year plan, but guess what? Here it is. Take it. This doesn't come up every day. And she showed me her current space and she was right. It's our tea shop. And so we accelerated our five-year plan into about three months, which was really intense. I wouldn't recommend it, but it's what we did. And it, it worked out, you know, if you ever, if you came to our shop during that first month, we were open. Oh my gosh, we we're such a mess. But maybe that's a little bit of the moral of the story is even if you think you're not quite prepared, um, you know, sometimes you just have to really jump in. So that's kind of the whole thing condensed down um, our, our path on how we got here. And we do have tons of material and things we want to share with you today. So I'm going to turn it back over to Megan so she can segue us into Etsy specific chat. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for the background. I think that's really helpful for everybody to understand. So let's talk about Etsy. When did you start on the platform and what has changed about it since you started? Oh man, I couldn't give you a full rundown of all the things that change. I feel like one of the biggest change, there's been a lot of feature increases over the years. Um, I first started selling craft kits in zines, which are like independently published booklets or magazines about crafting, kind of like a independently published comic. And so I started selling those on Etsy back in 2006, 2007, I was still in college and um, it was pretty straightforward, uh, pretty bare bones in a lot of ways. I think they had just come up, out. I'm not sure when they officially launched, but I feel like it wasn't too far before that. And since then, I feel like they've added a lot of search optimization features, a lot of SEO stuff. They've done things like integrate with social media, which is really helpful with Google shopping. One of the biggest things is um, when they first started, you could only sell handmade items and vintage items and that was it. And then there was a huge game changer. I'm not sure what the year was when they opened it up to selling supplies. Um, and you can search by category. So if you only wanna look at handmade things, you can. So it's still, it's really helpful. It's a really great marketplace still for handmade things. Um, and then the other big change was more recently, I believe it was 2019 or maybe it was 2020 even, in order to be more competitive with marketplaces like Amazon, they made it so uh, they highly encouraged everyone to offer free shipping of $35 or for any order over $35, which is something to be aware of. Um, you can choose not to do that. You can opt out of the free shipping program for orders over $35 but you will be deranked in the search quite significantly. So unless you're really pushing your own traffic, um, it's kind of in your best interest to adjust your pricing to accommodate for shipping, assuming it's going to be free. So those, your, are, those are the big ones I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah. In your experience, what type of an audience is usually on Etsy and how does that differ from maybe your own website or other platforms that you're using? Sure. So we started out on eBay and, and I think in some ways it's really good to compare it to other, other platforms. So like 
um, and like what it isn't. And so like eBay was really great for us, especially because we were initially selling bulk herbs exclusively. People are kind of looking for a deal. They're looking for used things. They're looking for um, a good, a good value. I, and like, it's just kind of a different kind of mindset. It's like the kind of, you know, it, honestly, eBay is kind of my people, right? We're the ones digging through the Goodwill and the garage sales, right? Like, so that's the kind of person that you're going to find there. On the same set, you'll find a, people who are very independently minded, a lot of really esoteric, interesting people from all walks of life. Um, and, and so for some industries, it's like the best place to sell, like used cars. Absolutely, eBay Motors is the way to go. Um, some people do sell their art on there and craft and things, but it's a much harder sell. It's more of a place if you're going to be reselling like a bucket of vintage buttons, that might be a good place to sell. Now, if you want to take the time to take those vintage buttons and kit them out onto like unique little place car or like placard kind of things and repackage them beautifully and curate a collection of gorgeous vintage buttons, Etsy is where it's at. Because the people who are shopping on Etsy, they're really looking for your taste. Like they're looking for, to you to like pick out something for them. It's kind of like the difference between shopping at Goodwill and shopping at a really nice secondhand consignment shop, right? So like sometimes if I'm feeling like I just want to get something really nice and I don't want to have to dig through everything to find the three nice things in the rack, I'm going to head over to Miss Myers or the loft instead of going to Salvation Army or a garage sale because like they've already done all the hard work for me. So like in the vintage selection, that's how Etsy really differs or and also the supply side, um, you know, quality, craftsmanship, artisan. Now are people still looking for a deal? Of course. Um, you know, a lot of times, and, and one of the problems with Etsy, and this is inevitable in any craft or art marketplace, is you always have people who are not really valuing their work. They're kind of, they're doing it for fun, which is awesome. And like me with craft leftovers, especially when I first got started, just to kind of like make back what it costs. And so they're not really keeping in mind making an earning wage from it. And so their prices are super suppressed. So if you look at something like crochet dishcloths, you're going to find a spectrum of things on Etsy. You're going to find like organic linen crochet dishcloths for like $30 for a packet of two. You're also going to find them with peaches and cream cotton, which is awesome. I love that stuff. And they're going to be like $2 for crochet dishcloth and free shipping. Like it's nuts. And so that's something else to keep in mind is that um, when you look at pricing on Etsy, I got totally off track. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. You, you <laughs> but, yeah. off for things we're going to cover too. That's a great. Yeah. Point. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I will cut myself off there, but yeah, <laughs> so you're going to find somebody who they're really looking for you to help them um, they're looking for a high quality product that's unique and that really speaks to their artistic and uh, kind of aesthetic sensibilities. Awesome. And I want to make a note now. So as we go forward, the slides are going to be very text heavy with information. And really, these are a resource for you all. They're going to be sent after this um, session today. And there's a lot of live links in them to direct you to other resources. So we are not going to cover every single bullet point that you see on the screen, but we are going to talk about them from Kristen's experience. And then these will all be a reference point for you go forward to use um, when you do set up your Etsy page. So just briefly, can we talk about like the costs and the benefits of Etsy versus other platforms that you could use and why somebody might choose Etsy and the benefits that come along with that? Um. I think one is tapping into that demographic, like for Little Woods and Craft Leftovers, it's like our people, you know, um, think like hipster, right? Like we love them. <laughs> and, um, and so getting access to that kind of really specific artisan minded group is really beneficial for certain types of businesses like ours, where we're selling an artisan product. 
that being the case, um, you know, just like any selling platform, you're going to be paying some additional fees. The really nice thing about Etsy that makes it a great low barrier to entry is it's, well, if you sell a lot, it's going to be more expensive because you're selling and that's good. I like paying taxes, <laughs> and, but to get started, it's literally 20 cents per listing. And so say if you have 10 things that all look the same. So for instance, 10 one ounce pouches of fireside black tea, you make one listing in a quantity of 10 and it still only costs 20 cents. And it's not until you sell it that you pay that 5% transaction fee. They used to work, I guess that's another big change is that they used to take payment through PayPal. So you were then hit with another about 5% transaction fee. It's less than that, but after like the 35 cents per transaction and everything else, it, for us, it worked out to about 5%. You ended up paying 10% in processing fees. So now they've brought that all in-house and it's covered. So their, their transaction fee used to be a little lower, but then you were also paying a PayPal transaction fee where now it's all kind of baked in to that 5%. And so that's actually come down over the years, which is really exciting. Another really great aspect of it is um, that they do tap into social media to make it available for you to use like Pinterest shopping and Google shopping without having to go through the pain and suffering of setting it up yourself um, at Littlewoods to get our products on from our website onto Google shopping. We actually paid a uh, like a firm, like an advertising firm to do it for us or like kind of navigate the process for us. And it was, it was really expensive and um, pretty cost prohibitive to get on to do it yourself because it's pretty technical. It's significantly tech, there's a significant technical barrier. Um, and so Etsy kind of does all that for you and you just have to toggle, like check a little box when you're making your listing. Awesome. So low barrier to entry, good stuff. So then do you convert your customers from Etsy to your other platforms like your website? And if yes, how do you do yeah. that while still following Etsy's rules and guidelines? Yeah, so that's the thing. So you can, as far as I know, unless they change their policies and I'm now no longer compliant, um, in your like shop banner and like on your about page, you can put a link to your website um, but, which, is, but you can't, if somebody messages you, you can't then refer them out to your website or you can't conduct like a transaction, like you can't work around Etsy. So like someone says, Hey, I want this thing. Can you give me 5% off because you're not going to have to pay Etsy's fees? Um, can I, you know, can you, I just pay you directly kind of thing? they actually monitor messages for keywords that will clue them in if you're operating business off Etsy through Etsy contact. Um, so just in eBay is the same way. So it's not like an uncommon thing. So they really want you to keep it on, but you can in your about section mention your website. And then what we do that's been really successful is we include a coupon in every single order and a sample of our blends. Like I mentioned earlier, when we were first getting started, that the biggest barrier for people purchasing our tea blends, which is what makes us unique, um, and will also generate loyalty because you can't get it anywhere else, is getting people to taste it. And so we always include a sample of a blend. So they're experiencing like what's unique about us. And ideally it's a blend that's not available on Etsy combined with a coupon. So then we can track where that sale is coming from. And so then hopefully the idea is that Etsy doesn't generate a ton of income for us. It's probably less than 5% of our business, but that every single sale, there's a probability that we're gaining a customer and customers are pretty expensive to get new customers. And so if we can just like scoot them over to our web store from Etsy, that's definitely ideal. That's awesome. Helpful insider tips. So let's talk about the specifics of setting up a shop. So let's say I've never been on Etsy. What did it look like when you first started and what parts of 
your page, your shop that's available to fill out, do you think have been the most helpful and beneficial to create sales? Um, the like featured items section is really important. Etsy now has a lot of options for layout. And I think they even have like a pro sellers account, which we don't utilize. Um, you can definitely tell the shops that do. There's just a lot more customization. And um, I mean, in a lot of ways, not much has changed with Etsy's layout. It's like you've got a banner, you've got your shop name and logos, you've got some shop announcements, categories down the side, and your products. And I swear, it's looked pretty close to this since the beginning. Um, and so really like kind of drilling down your categories because it's such a prominent feature in your shop layout. And it's also a really useful tool for like adding on additional sales. So maybe like in our instance, maybe they come for rose petals. Well, so maybe they'd be interested in bulk items that are also good for blending teas. And so we have like a bulk section. Um, we have an herbal tea section and all those kinds of things. So that way if they can click on the category and within that category, you can kind of um, hopefully do some good add-on sales that they'll find something that they weren't necessarily looking for, but why not throw it in the cart since I'm, you know, ordering from this person anyway. Awesome. So now we're actually gonna take a look behind the scenes. We are going to walk through the process of listing a product and kind of what it looks like. This slide for your reference, when you come back to this after, these are all live links that go to the Etsy's resource section that explains each of these steps. So if you need a little bit more help, that's what this slide is for. But I'm actually gonna stop sharing so that Kristen can and walk us through the back end and what it looks like when you list a product. And if anybody has questions, feel free to throw those in the chat and we will stop as we go and try and answer them as well. Okay, so I wanted to show you first kind of like what the listing page looks like. Um, so this is the listing for our T Passport subscription. Uh, this is definitely one we are always trying to get people because you order three months, you get tw like 12 of our teas, which is awesome about just getting that tea into people's hands. So some of the things you'll notice is like you know, your overall shop review, how many sales you have, that kind of thing, whether or not it's in stock. Um, you've got variations you can add, which is really nice. And these are things that it can be a variation based on like price, but it can also be a variation based on color with like no price change. So say you have, going back to the dishcloth example, I actually really love crochet dishcloth. So, you know, maybe you have blue, green, and gray, but it's pretty much the same item, you can put those as variations and they can pick, or maybe you have a multi-pack, which is a price change and a color change. And so that's kind of, can be taken there. And then they have this nice little highlight section. And again, kind of calling out that it's handmade versus vintage or a supply um, and your materials list. So kind of like key materials, I feel a little, shame faced about this. Normally I update the materials with every single tea passport box. Um, and I didn't this time. So basically it would re reflect the teas in the current box. Then our description, you can get pretty long, but you should know that you can really only see this much, like those first six lines and then everything else, they have to click this, learn more. And then you can learn a lot more you know, shipping policy, et cetera. And then of course, where you can meet more from the shop. You also may like kind of related products and that kind of thing. And then you have this really nice review section. And so it's calling out specific reviews about this box. And then you can also click on reviews for the sh whole shop, which is really nice. This key photo, like that is your showcase photo. And it's, the one that you should really pay the most attention to. But it's also good to know that the more photos you have, the more that Etsy kind of like puts your item towards the top of the search. It's not, it used to just be based on when you listed. 
most recent first. And now like eBay and Amazon, they use different algorithms to define what's showing up when, which is really important to think about when you're creating your listing. Um, I think what happened is they found people were gaming the system and they were unlisting and relisting the same products every single day or like every third day and kind of gaming it. And so they decided that just by going newest first wasn't necessarily the best thing. And then you kind of just have some more detail shots that you can throw in there. And so then that's like what it looks like customer facing or like outward facing. So then from the back end, when you go to create your product, this is what you'll see. So you've got your images. Um, if you have those variations, you can add variation images as well that will be tied to your variation. You can adjust your thumbnail and that's what's gonna show up in the search um, and as well as in your, product, uh, in your shop. This is newer, you can add videos now, which honestly, I just saw that today and I was like, oh yeah, we should make a little video, shouldn't we, of like a unboxing. Um, and then your listing details. So you've got fun things like, you know, your title, um, which there's some really great information in our slides about uh, kind of creating a title. Really look at other sellers that are in a similar category to you. And I'm not saying steal from them, I'm, but really like it's not proprietary necessarily. Like, are they using the, you know, the words say crochet dishcloth? That's just gonna be my example for today. So are they saying crocheted and then dishcloth? Are they saying dishcloth is dishcloth one word or two? Are they using washcloth instead? Are they using wash rag? You know, like what is their phrasing there that's grabbing people's attention? So look at those sellers that are in a price range similar to yours that are where you wanna be targeting, you know, like look at the sellers that are selling the kinds of things at the kind of price that you wanna be selling them. And that's a really good place to look at those kinds of, like what are their keywords? What material phrases are they using? And then whether or not you made this, someone on your team made it, um, you know, et cetera, is it finished, you know, a supplier tool to make things. So when we sell like bulk rows, well, it's a supply, it's, we didn't make it. And then that it's made to order versus when it was made. Um, and so this, it's not made yet. We make them to order after they're purchased. So that's how we list it. And then the, the category, and this is so important because if people are just browsing around on Etsy, especially if Etsy is the primary way that you want to, um, if Etsy is the primary way that you're promoting your handmade goods, like you're not expecting to be pushing traffic to Etsy, um, but that Etsy is indeed getting the traffic to your site, where you place yourself in a category is really super important. So again, do that market research, look where other people are putting their items and who's selling well, what where. Like for us, obviously it's a tea subscription. Tea is the category we should be in. A quick side note about selling food items on Etsy, they do require you to have a commercial kitchen and to have proof of a food certificate, I believe, or at least kind of verify that you do indeed um, you know, that you, you've been inspected and that kind of thing. Um, and then you've got your primary color. So like, what's the point of this? Sometimes people will specifically search for like blue sweater or blue gift item, you know, whatever the thing is because they love that color or their friend that they're buying a gift for loves that color. And so really just like look at your primary image. What are the colors that pop out to you first? So for us, it's green and then brown, even though you know, tea is all kinds of different colors. Just do your best. It's optional. If you're like, I don't know, that's fine. Just leave it blank. And then occasion. Now the thing about occasion is technically a tea subscription is a Mother's Day present, right? Absolutely. It's not specifically a Mother's Day present. So what would fall into this category is a crochet dishcloth that says mom's the best on it or something like that. You know, like that would be a Mother's Day present. Um, so it really needs to be specific to the occasion, like a Christmas card or Christmas stationery would go into the Christmas category, of course, that kind of thing. Um, but don't, don't just tack it on there. They actually, uh, they get kind of upset and they ban people. It's a thing they do. 
<laughs> they will like shut down your shop. Um, even if you don't, even if it's an accident, you know? So I personally always put everything on automatic renewal, but maybe you're selling something for a specific term or you only really have a specific quantity. Uh, don't automatically renew it. You can just let it expire. Maybe it's a seasonal item and you will only want it to be available during the holidays. Um, is it physical or digital? If you select digital, a bunch of other options will show up and give you a chance to like up to upload your digital product. Um, a great example of that would be like, I sell a knitted cat hoodie pattern on my craft leftovers Etsy site, and that's a digital asset. So whenever it sells, I don't have to do anything. It's, it's amazing. So someone buys a cat hoodie, like knit pattern, it gets automatically sent to them. I don't have to do a thing. So it's really nice passive income. Um, if there's any way you can integrate something like that into your business, I highly recommend it. Then your description and these kind of fun tags and materials in the section of your shop. So this like section or category of your shop. And then um, the, uh, you know, your tags. So tags are great for, you know, really think about, try to get in the head of your customer. So like, think about that ideal person that you love, like they buy something of yours and you're like, oh, Susan bought something again. I love Susan. She's like my best customer. You know, I wish I had more Susans. So think of Susan, how is she searching and finding you? And really try to like, it's kind of funny, but some people actually recommend like role-playing, like you know, really fill out that customer profile and think like, what is she looking for? What is she trying to experience? What is, she, why is she on Etsy in the first place? And what kind of words or phrases would she use to find your product? Um, and then materials is really a lot more straightforward. Like what are the physical materials that are used to create it? Is it wood? Is it metal? Is it cotton yarn? Is it linen yarn? Um, that kind of thing. And of course, price is price. So for this, this is a variation product. And so once you click that it has variables, you can kind of add them down here in the individual prices and whether or not they're visible. And then how many are in stock. Now, the one downside, unless they've changed things, I don't think you can set a specific quantity for each variation, but maybe that's changed and I'm just not seeing it here. Um, so there's just a quantity for the overall like the overall product listing, not each variation. So going back to our crochet dishcloths, if you're out of blue yarn, you might need to make that variation, like keep an eye on your inventory levels because you'll need to mark it as out of stock or like not visible. Um, otherwise you could disappoint some customers, which is never good. And then you've got shipping, which uh, Megan and I decided that there really could be a whole workshop just on e-commerce shipping. So I'm going to glaze over this a little bit and any specific questions you have at the end, we will, I will absolutely answer. But basically the thing to know is that really Etsy encourages you to set up free shipping for orders of $35 or more. So in some ways it's almost best now other than international shipping to offer um, just bake in the shipping cost into your into your product. And so there's lots of options with shipping. You can create profiles, like we have a tea blend profile and it's like pretty standard $3.50. We're assuming we're sending it first class. They're just getting a one-off, you know, to like some people buy like two ounces of rose petals. And so they'll get charged $3.50 because that's approximately what it costs to ship it. Then um, where your country of origin is, your origin zip code, Processing time. Now, processing time, I really want to draw attention to this because you can do one business day, which will qualify you to kind of, again, get pushed up in the search results if you have like same day or next day shipping. Is that reasonable for you? For me, it's not. We have at any given time, at our best, one to two business days to get things out the door for Etsy. And we know this about ourselves. We same day is really, really hard to meet that demand. Um, and if you do it, honestly, I found that those customers, they are really in a hurry. They really need your thing right now because they've got a birthday present or something like that. Um, 
So they can also be the ones who leave you like the worst feedback if you mess it up, uh, which can, again, bring your search rankings down significantly. Um, maintaining good feedback is super important. So make sure to set clear expectations both for your customers and for yourself. And yeah, technically we could get orders out in one day, but I don't think I would, I wouldn't want this job, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that's not, that's not what I'm here for. And I feel like most, most Etsy purchasers really respect that. So anyway, I'm, I'm going down that rabbit hole, Megan, I'm sorry. We talked about this earlier that I'm like, I have a tendency. So anyway, beyond shipping item weight and sizes, I feel pretty, pretty straightforward. Grab a scale, grab a measuring tape, figure it out. And, um, and, and that is pretty much it, except for this very last thing. Do you want it to be advertised? And so that's going to advertise it like on the Etsy homepage. I think that also maybe puts it in Google shopping, but maybe that's separate. It costs money. So be mindful of that and make sure to check out what you're like in the first time you click it on, they'll give you a whole bunch of options and walk you through and set a daily budget and all that kind of stuff. And so it, for us, it makes sense for us to advertise our tea subscription, but not necessarily some of our other products. So it is an active choice for each individual product that we make. Also, when thinking about it getting pushed out onto Google Shopping, you know, some handmade objects just might not be good Google Shopping material, that the people who are shopping for things through Google Shopping might not be looking for an artisan dishcloth, right? So it just kind of it kind of depends what your product is. Anyway, that's that. I'm going to stop sharing and maybe, yes. Okay. We actually got some great questions during that time. So, oh, heck um, yeah, you did. First, somebody <laughs> asked, how do you find out what the algorithms are for Etsy? And um, like, how do you keep up with those? That's a great question. Um, I've definitely fallen behind a couple times and we saw a significant drop in sales. Um, Etsy forms are a great resource. There's a lot of really dedicated people on there that are figuring that kind of thing out. There's also really a lot of good um, like blog posts and YouTube videos about it too, where it's kind of like best guess. A little bit like Google, they don't publish it because they don't want people to game the system. But if you go to the seller's hub, and look at like, how do I do better in search rankings kind of thing. Um, they will give you like sellers pro tips. And oftentimes if you follow those, uh, you know, you'll do okay. I think the thing is, is offering that free shipping of $35 or more, um, quick shipping time, like not just what you're saying you're gonna do, but your actual like from the time someone orders to the time you upload your tracking. And um, what's the other thing I was going to say? Maybe that was it. Yeah. Oh, and I guess not having like uh, feedback is the other big one. So like, do you have 99.9% .9 positive reviews or do you have like that are positive or yeah, that are positive or do you have like 20% negative reviews? That's really going to devalue your listings quite significantly. Um, we were also asked about photos, which we will get to. So yeah. I'm going to hold off on that one. Yep. Um, a question about video, does it have the same weight or more as photos with the search engine, I'm guessing? Oh, with a search engine, you know, honestly, my guess would be, and I have nothing to back this up, is that because it's their newest feature that, yeah, they want you to use it. <laughs> So like, if you do, you're going to, you're going to get a little bump. Um, and Michael, you said, would this work with greeting cards? Uh, could you let us know what specifically what you're referring to? Oh, and how do I make product labels? So we actually use a thermal printer and I just use PDFs that we print out um, on a thermal printer. And that's how we do really kind of just basic black and white product labels. Um, it's, it's very economical. And then we started out on an inkjet and just like 
you know, print them out on like shipping label kind of stuff that you get at Staples. Um, and then transition to the thermal la label printer. Uh, Morning Bell actually gave us that protein. He's like, why are you doing, why don't you do it this way? And I'm like, I don't know, because I didn't think of it. Um, and the marketing materials, I use Adobe Creative Cloud, I think it's referred to now, or used to be Creative Suite. And uh, like Illustrator, Photoshop, InDesign are kind of my best friends. And then uh, some of them I get printed. So like everything in our T subscription, I get printed over at, um, what is their name? It's like Ames Copy Center or Alpha Copies in West Ames um, and that kind of thing. I just design it myself, but I have a background in graphic design. So that made, that made sense for me. There's also a free website you can use for design called canva.com. Oh, yeah, so that's if a good you, one. If you are kind of before the stage of being comfortable with Photoshop and things, that's a free resource that you can use prior to investing. Fifty dollars a month. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is a bit of a barrier. Yeah. Great questions. Keep them coming. It's super helpful to to be able to answer. What is the free resource name here? I'll type it in. Oh yeah, Canva. C A. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So it's a mobile app too, so it's good for social media as well. Yeah, and they resize things and yeah, super handy. Um, so everybody now is seeing these 20 questions. And again, we're not gonna go through each one, but the point of this slide is to kind of think about what are things maybe that your customers had questions about that would maybe stop them from purchasing your product on Etsy. And how do you anticipate those questions or know what they might be and then integrate them into a listing to help you make that sale? Um, oh man. <laughs> okay, so what I do, uh, so like what, to surmise, um, kind of like what are the questions that I ask myself when I'm making a listing to like figure out how to write my description? Okay, so I, it, a lot of it is best guess, but I kind of go back to that archetype person. Um, at the end, we have a link to um, a post I did of kind of like creative entrepreneurial resources. And I linked to this thing called Creative Live in class with like Lisa Cogden. And, um, and um, I've also taken some other classes about like marketing and that sort of stuff through Creative Live. And sorry, I got a little uh, sidetracked by comments. Um, and, one of the things they talk about is creating a customer archetype, which is something I've just started to do that's, but I've already found it extremely helpful. So <laughs> this is gonna be really funny. And Maria, if you're in the audience, um, maybe I should change your name, but so we'll just call you Maria. So we have this customer who's, we have one Maria and another Jennifer, and they're like such great customers. They are, interesting. They're kind. They're patient with us. They love not just our teas, but also our spice blends and also have gotten tea subscriptions and sign up for our classes. And then they also share our stuff with other people. They're like super fans. It's, it's amazing. Every time they come in, I am like happy to see them. You also might have customers from time to time where they are that same thing, but every time you interact with them, you're like, oh my gosh, because they are just, they're hard. They're, they're just a little harder. And, you know, it's nothing against them as a person. It's just, you know, sometimes that's just the way it is. And, and then you have other customers where not only do they get your least valued item with like the lowest markup, least profitable thing you produce, but they make you suffer for it. Like they are hard and then they leave you bad feedback even though you did your best. So when writing your product description, think about, Maria and Jennifer, what would they like to hear? What did they want to know? Think about what kind of things they're into and then write the product description as if you were writing for them. <laughs> that was like the best advice I ever got. And it's been super helpful already. And as I've started to rewrite my descriptions for our bulk botanicals and teas, I'm thinking, 
what would Maria and Jennifer want to know about this tea? I'm not kidding. And it's super awesome. helpful. Customer discovery. That's great. So now let's talk about money. Let's talk about how you price <sighs> products. Yeah, that that's a hard one. I still struggle with this. So I feel like I have it fairly figured out for Little Woods, which is a little more straightforward. Fairly figured out for craft. Um, art is still crazy hard for me. Uh, I always feel like I'm either overpricing or underpricing my stuff. And whenever I think I've got it right, someone's like, oh, that's so expensive or, oh, that's so cheap. And I'm like, I don't know. Um, so at a minimum, the things that you definitely want to make sure to do is cover your costs, which may seem easy, like crochet dishcloths, right? So I make a crochet dishcloth. It takes me one hour and it takes a half of a ball of peaches and cream yarn. So technically my cost is like a dollar plus my time. And I'm gonna pay myself $10 an hour because that seems fair. Um, unfortunately, the chances of you selling every single thing you create is pretty small. And so you have to factor in that if you make 10 crochet dishcloths, you might only sell six to eight. And so you have to kind of assume your cost is like take a batch of like 10 crochet dishcloths. It costs me $8 or $10 to produce those and then divide that by the amount that you'll actually think you'll sell, which I know that's really abstract and you'll have a hard time figuring out what if you don't sell any, what if you only sell one, but you kind of have to just take a best guess of what your optimal ratio is. And you know, like maybe those other four you give away as gifts or you put them on clearance or whatever, but assume that you're not gonna generate income from them. And then how do you pay yourself? That is a really complex and personal problem or personal question for each individual person because we each have different expectations of what our income level should be. So assuming you only sell 60% of what you generate, if it took you an hour, but then it's also gonna take you an hour to make the listing, photograph it, maybe two hours, and then social media promote it. Maybe you're gonna blog about it. And then you also have to pack it and ship it. And what if the customer has questions and that all adds up? So like this thing that took you 30 minutes to a half hour or to an hour to make, to actually complete the product sale might actually take you five hours. So even if you're only selling one crochet dishcloth and you're only paying yourself $10 an hour, you're out, you know, now it's a $50 crochet dishcloth. So one of the things you can do is try to figure out, so those are some of the different time things that you should consider. But the other kind of like <laughs> crazy thing is if you're thinking about doing this for your living, which is awesome and you should, uh, what about insurance and taxes and all that other kind of stuff? So there's this really great resource called the, um, I said I was gonna look this up and then I didn't. It's like the graphis, graphic artists or no, commercial artists guide, uh, guidebook, I think is what it is, commercial artists guidebook. And it's done by the Commercial Arts Guild, I believe based out of Chicago. It's a wonderful resource for pricing for actually like drilling down into what do I want my annual salary to be beyond the cost of what I've sold, insurance, taxes, all that kind of good stuff. And then, um, and then how to divide that out into like an hourly rate. And what I kind of do is I assume so many hours for kind of order fulfillment and then so many hours for like content creation and production and kind of figure out pricing from there based on how many products on average I'm gonna be selling. And sometimes you'll find that it's not like there's some items that you might really want to sell that you cannot figure out how to make financial sense. So there's a lot of ways you can become more efficient. So one thing like with crochet, when I first made a crochet dishcloth, it took me an hour. Now I can bang one out in like 20 minutes. And because I changed up my stitches, I use a half double crochet instead of a single crochet and all those kinds of things you can do. You can change your material cost. Um, 
Also repetition is a great time saver. So for instance, while all those things maybe took me five hours for the very first listing, once I sell a hundred of them, that listing cost, like the hour it took me to make the listing or the two hours to do the photo across 100 sales is gonna be really insignificant, like pennies. And so that brings that hourly cost down per product. If you're creating a unique thing every single time and having to photograph it, list it as an individual thing, that's where it gets really hard and you really need to make sure to be adding in those additional costs of like the time it takes to create the listing and promote it versus something where you're like our T subscription, the listing pretty much stays the same every single month. And so that allows us to like reduce that cost. We had a good question in chat and then I realized we skipped photos. So we'll have to go back and talk about photography quick, but they asked how long should you try and sell an item before marking the price down to try and get it to move? Um, I think that's, that's really up to you and your storage capacity and your also like personal financial position. Also the nature of your business. So here at Little Woods, things have a finite um, shelf life. So we do the um, like dollar day sales and well, basically twice a year, we clearance out anything that's anywhere near reaching a date where we would want to move it um, just because it has an expiration date. So, you know, seasonal sales are pretty common. Like, so maybe you created a bunch of Christmas stuff, or maybe you created a bunch of stuff surrounding the election, right? Like that's not coming around again for another four years. So you want to try to unload it as quickly as possible at that point, mark it down. But especially with handmade goods, there's really, unless you physically need to move it because it's demoralizing your existence or taking up too much storage, there's not really a need to mark it down. Um, as far as adjusting your prices down in general, I think in some ways before you adjust your prices down, I would really evaluate those other areas of your listing, like how's your photography, you know, how's your um, description, is it in the right category, and do some market research and figure out like why is other people's product moving and mine isn't. Yeah, great point. So on the photography side, what are some suggestions for people for photography and especially for somebody who's just starting out and maybe doesn't have like a fancy camera or other resources. Yeah, well, one of the great things is that cell phone cameras are freaking awesome now. Like that portrait mode on my iPhone, I use that more than my Nikon, which my Nikon is awesome. And I use the Nikon still when I really want to do pro or when I'm doing more like blog posts, but for social media, for product listings, a lot of times I'll just pull out my iPhone. Natural light is always going to be best. It gives everything this really, um, it, it just looks good. It looks natural. It's natural light. It looks natural. I like north facing windows. Um, and one of the general things is to kind of clear the clutter. So like remove any background, anything that's distracting from it, unless it's a really intentional prop. Um, you really want to highlight and showcase the thing that you're doing. So, you know, right now you probably see all this clutter in my background. If I was really with it, I would have like staged this perfectly behind me um, and, and that kind of thing. Although what I do have is not bad. It's like my paintings and zines and books, which I love, but um, it's not inappropriate, but it's a little clutter back there. And it's kind of the same way in your photography for your products, like you really want it to shine. And so um, we, for our, if you're thinking about selling a subscription, there's a website called Crate Joy, which I'll just, um, which is a subscription specific website and they will sell your and manage your subscription for you. You know, you still have to fulfill it and everything and update your listing just like anywhere else. But um, it's hard to get onto. And I tried and failed to get on it several times. I mean, I'm not a bad photographer, but I'm not a professional. And so we actually paid to get our product shots of our boxes done. And I feel like you can, I mean, you can really see what an amazing job they did. Um, you know, if, if you go to, well, like when we were looking at it before, like they, it looks outstanding. They did a wonderful job. And um, 
And in the process of getting those done, I kind of learned how I could do better taking photographs of it in the future. And I've since created my own photographs for the T subscription box. But anyway, like sometimes it's okay to like also just go get it shot professionally if that's really intimidating. And usually, especially here in Ames, you can find an awesome art student who's really good at photography and they will do it for you for a pretty nominal fee. Uh, for professional photography, you can expect to spend at least 100 to $300 per product. Awesome. So I know shipping is a big topic and we can visit that now. And in the meantime, if there are more questions, I know we're coming down to the end of the session. So let us know if there are more questions and we'll kind of cut off the shipping conversation to try and answer those. But in the meantime, do you want to share all of the tips that you've learned about tip? About yeah, yeah. I, I still mess it up. So that's one thing to know is like, you know, it's a lot. There's a lot to shipping to kind of wrangle and it really depends on your on what you're shipping. So for us, we sell things that can easily go first class mail through the United States Postal Service. So that's what we do. Um, a good thing to know about Etsy is you can actually purchase your labels through Etsy's back end when you make a sale. It uploads the tracking automatically and provides verification that you've got it in the mail and all that kind of jazz and that it's on the way, which is really nice. And because it's through their website, you get bulk um, shipping rates. So you have like a, it costs a lot less. If you're looking for um, just like a little, a little aside, if you're looking for shipping service to, to um, ship without Etsy's backend, pirateship.com, which I kind of love that name, uh, is a really great resource that's free to ship your um, your product. And it's also a really great place to just dig around and put in a bunch of different box specs and find what a good shipping rate is. It's good to know they're also only shipping United States Postal Service or USPS. Now, a lot of artists, they prefer to ship FedEx or UPS. I'm less familiar with those, um, though the big thing to know is that the more you ship, the better your price. So if you are going to go that way, definitely sign up for an account so they can kind of attach each sale to your specific account and you'll see over time that your shipping cost decreases. Um, and really the best way to do it is to just try it. Uh, there are endless guides on optimizing shipping costs, keeping your weight and size as like overall box dimensions as small as possible is a really great uh, way to way to go and think about everything you're putting in there from all the you know coupons and handouts to your packing peanuts or tissue paper or whatever that all has a weight to it and it's really that total box weight so then put that on the scale um, there's a scale you can use at the post office if you don't have one and really the best way to do it is package up your thing as best you can take it to the post office and ship it to somebody you know. It's like a surprise gift for them. Maybe your mom is due a gift or something like that in May and see if it makes it there okay. Ask them what they thought about the packaging and ask for their feedback. Um, yeah, so for something like stickers, you probably wanna do some kind of like rigid cardboard mailer uh, or like chipboard mailer. You can find, you know, really a really great place to go is just over to um, Staples in here in town and look through their shipping aisle. What, what are your options even? Um, and then once you kind of figure out what you want to sh ship with, like, you know, that like uh, what size box or letter or whatever, go to a place like uline.com and you can get your shipping supplies in mass, like a pallet of cardboard boxes and that kind of thing, you know, much smaller too. But you're going to be ordering like 50 boxes at a time versus just one off the shelf. And that will really decrease your cost of shipping too. Um, they also have endless options, which is kind of fun to just look around. I really nerd out about shipping. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's definitely one of those tangent areas. Uh, so well, we, we have a few oh, go more ahead. good questions too. Okay, yeah, so yeah. somebody asked, is it better to have more listings with variations of products or less listings that focus on core offerings? Oh, oops, I apologize. 
Um, that is a really great question. I think it's kind of specific to your item types. If you can manage it, I would say, yeah, it really depends. Um, okay, so going back to the crochet dishcloth option. Um, <laughs> um, like it might be really nice to have individual listings for each one of those colors because then when someone goes to your shop, they'll see this like rainbow beautiful effect of crochet dishcloths, right? And versus they won't really get to see all that unless they get to that individual product. If you offer like a bunch of different pattern types and then color variations within that, it might be more appealing for you to say like, these are your patterns that you can choose from. And then each listing, you then get to pick your colors. So it's a little bit about the customer experience. Now for us with T, it's really, it's kind of industry standard to list the T type and then the size quantities. And so for us, that makes the most sense. We're not maintaining separate like one ounce, two ounce, four ounce, pound for each individual. Because then if you go to our shop, we'd have like six of the same product photo. And that just wouldn't be very appealing from the customer standpoint. And it would make it difficult to navigate within the store. I know that we are at the end of the hour. So if anybody has to leave, feel free. We're going to send the slides after and a recording. But Kristen, as long as you have time, we can keep answering these questions. Yeah, sure. I would love to. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope that I have been able to give you at least a little bit of information, inspiration. I mean, the big thing, the big takeaway is just try it. It's like, it can be really intimidating and feel like this really big decision. I'll be honest, it's usually pretty anticlimactic and don't get discouraged. It took me a long time to make my first sale. And it was a sale that I made by like driving it there myself. I think it was my friend, you know, it's totally worth it. And the more you sell, the easier it gets. So just get out there and get started. You can always delete old listings and, you know, pretend like they never happened. If, you know, you don't like them in the future, don't, don't feel like, um, you know, no one's going to hold it against you if you don't get it right the first time. That's great advice. Just start something. <laughs> <laughs> just do it. <laughs> yes. Just steal a catchphrase. Yeah. Um, so in regards to photo, is it helpful to have photos that um, are all the same, like in the same background or have it in a different setting. So different sellers take different approaches. I would say the most important thing is that it has the same aesthetic. So for us, we kind of wanted, like when someone saw a listing of our bulk botanicals, we wanted to the um, we wanted them to almost immediately identify like, oh, that's from the Littlewood shop. Not because we had the logo, but because that bulk botanical photo was always styled the exact same way to create like that kind of consistent branding and lighting and all that kind of jazz. And so we always have it slightly offset. So you get some white and then you get the bulk botanical kind of sweeping in. And that's that first image every time. And then we might do like a little pile and then a back away. But now with our tea subscription, we do, um, is it okay if I share my screen again real quick? Yeah, let me stop sharing. Okay. So like, oh, this is so funny. It's like in the way. Like I, I can't click on my thing because the Zoom menu is in the way. Um, so, like we have kind of this nice front photo and it's all the same background, but then we kind of have this more fun staggered shot with a hand. People really love to see that human interaction. So like, think about, <laughs> I, I really do love crochet dishcloths. So, and I, I used to sell them on craft leftovers. Um, so think like it could be really fun to have like a sudsy sink with the dishcloth, like, you know, with hands in action, like, your dishwashing experience is going to be so completely revolutionized with my crochet dishcloth. Uh, don't you want to be like this? Like it's so much more enjoyable than using that store-bought 
crocheted one. Or you can do something kind of like this, where you're popping in some other elements to kind of um, highlight the thing that ties into it, like that it's a spring collection of tea, et cetera. Um, or just like some fun elements. But again, like thinking about, and this is getting more into like that branding side of all this, um, thinking about your branding, consistencies of colors and fonts and styles. I try to do this. I am definitely not always successful. Um, so, you know, again, a little bit like go for it and and you can kind of muddle through for a while and that's okay. Like one of the things that I found super helpful was on Pinterest, I just started gathering up images of product shots that I found really attractive and appealing that seemed to tie in well with the kind of aesthetic I was attempting to create. And then I even broadened it out like for our kind of like branding 101 is I started tagging things that had like the essence of our shop, like foggy woodland scenes and traditional tea services and a like, you know, Shinto shrine or whatever, which you wouldn't ever see, but you know, like kind of that traditional Zen experience, right? And like all the kind of things that we're trying to get. And then from those, I pulled colors and then I tried to find some fonts that match that aesthetic and appeal. So, um, you know, really like that consistency. So again, thinking about backgrounds and that kind of stuff. Yeah, like, you know, you can mix it up, but aesthetically they should all kind of tie together. That's the short answer. <laughs> I'm not good at short answers, I'm sorry. It's okay, these are super helpful answers. Um, we had somebody ask if you can talk a bit about Creative Life by Lisa Congdon. Oh, Creative Live by Lisa Cogden. Yeah, so um, that is, let me see if I can grab the link real quick. Um, so Creative Live is a online learning and I'm in full disclosure, I kind of fell in love with them and I, I was recommending them so often that I got an affiliate account. Um, so if you go to craftleftovers.com and that entrepreneurial resources blog post I did, there's some links there and those are affiliate links. Um, so it's a way you can support a local artist. And let's see, pretty much like all of her stuff is amazing. Um, but they have a lot of other classes and they're, they're geared towards, um, so Creative Live is like the online learning platform and Lisa Cogden is one of their many professional instructors. She's somebody I've admired when I first started Craft Leftover, she was just getting into craft blogging herself and just finding her way as an illustrator. So I feel like in some ways we've grown up in the industry together, although she has no idea who I am, I'm just a big fan. Um, and she's also sold on Etsy for a long time. And so she teaches classes about like workflow management, which I found that was probably the thing that saved me last year because I was just losing track of stuff all the time and not staying on task with projects. And so going through her class really helped revolutionize my workflow and time management skills, um, which is how I was able to do this today when I just did the alumni tasting yesterday. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> But they also have a lot of other classes on photography, on graphic design. Um, I'm working my way through one on doing Premiere Pro video editing. It really resourceful or helpful things for creative entrepreneurs, really specifically photographers, graphic designers, illustrators, those industries, I think is where they kind of got their start. So like think commercial art or graphic arts. Um, is where they're kind of core, but now they're reaching beyond that. They just started offering some classes, which I saw my friend Diane Gilland has one on um, her quilting, which is super cool. She's another one I met way back in the day during my craft industry days. And um, they also have like some lifestyle things like, I, I don't know, I, I could really, like I said, I, I'm an affiliate, but I'm affiliate because I'm kind of a super fan and I just kept recommending them that I was like, 
I should I should probably just be an affiliate at this point because I re recommend them so often. <laughs> so like full disclosure there. Yeah, that's. I awesome. feel like I could just like give them a commercial and like wax poetic <laughs> about them. Well, that means that you're probably one of their ideal customers. Back to yeah, that. That is that is true. Yeah, I I just I love learning. I actually miss university. So um, yeah, a lot of times while I'm working on spreadsheets and very exciting things like data entry which is a big part of being a business owner or payroll, et cetera. I'll have a creative live class go in and be learning about, you know, how to up my creative game or my social media skills. That's awesome. Well, it looks like we're out of questions and we're over time and I want to be respectful of your time too. Thank you so much for doing this today. This was great. I hope everybody found it really helpful. Like I said, we will be sending all the slides and the recording out after the session. And if you have questions, here's places where you can contact us. Um, and also the resources are live links as well. So the Creative Entrepreneur Resource Roundup is what she has been referencing to that's on her website and has all of these links that she's referenced today that you can go through and learn more about the different resources. So thank you can again, do, we really appreciate it. Can I do one, one last quick plug that I swear isn't yes. Creative Live? Um, yes. Just so you all know, because I feel like it might be one of those things where you're like, why didn't she mention this? Uh, next month is Littlewood's five-year anniversary that we've had the brick and mortar store. So we're going to be doing another online tea party anniversary party, which is just virtual and crazy and doing tea, tea party boxes. Um, so make sure to check out our social media and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, yeah, exactly. Say Hello and happy anniversary to Littlewood. I, I can't believe it's five years old already. It's totally wild. So thank you so much for making that possible. Because really, it, if it wasn't for the Ames community, we really would not be here. Yeah, that's awesome. Congrats. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again, everyone, for attending. Hopefully this was helpful. And if you're interested in the rest of our series, you can sign up and register through our website.